it's very rare that the procurement team that we deal with work on an isolated part of the business. They could be working on a whole broad range of procurement decisions, which therefore have some uh, macro strategy to them, which could be around you know duration of contracts, price saving, incentive based relationships, whatever it is. But understanding those kind of tensions or objectives is really important. My name's Mike Lander, and you're listening to Higgle, the B2B Sales Club podcast, where we bring you actionable insights about sales RFPs, negotiations, and difficult procurement discussions from sales leaders, brand leaders, and procurement leaders. Please subscribe to get updates when new episodes are released. Jonathan, thanks ever so much for joining me on Higgle, the B2B Sales Club podcast today. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. So it's great to talk to you again, Jonathan. I know we've had several conversations in the past and email exchanges. Um, so for the audience, uh, just explain kind of who you are, what you do, and anything unusual about yourself. Yeah, I'm the uh, managing director of uh, uh, George P. Johnson uh, in, in the UK. I have a, an EMEA role as well. Uh, George P. Johnson, uh, one of the leading event and experiential marketing agencies, uh, Found it, found it out of the US, still privately owned. Uh, we work across all regions in the in the world. Uh, really found it out of uh, the auto industry in Detroit, and then also like West Coast uh, tech, uh, predominantly specialized, specializing in large scale uh, kind of conferences, exhibitions, uh, proprietary owned events. So, sort of like our, our, I guess our flagship. Uh, event that people might have heard of is uh, is, is Dreamforce in San Francisco, uh, which we run for Salesforce with uh, like a, oh, over right. hundred thousand people. So wow. to give you a sense of when I say scale, okay. I mean scale, real scale. Yeah. So you go back to the unusual question. Yes. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's unusual, but you know, it's other people's context. Uh, I probably have an unhealthy passion for sport in that uh, I can't go past sport, whether it be TV live, without having an interest which uh <laughs> certainly infuriates my wife uh in terms of like what i will watch so, <laughs> so is uh, this any kind of sport uh, anything at all virtually i mean i i, I certainly have a, a hierarchy of uh of the, of the sort of standard things like uh, yeah. uh football uh and passionately into sort of cycling myself but any any sport that's uh live I can kind of lean into and watch and spend an inordinate amount of hours uh, just <laughs> deciding what the outcome will be and understanding like uh, uh, like the mechanics of the sport and what skill it takes to ah. kind of be the best. I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I like it from a, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, like an, an individual uh, like skill level perspective, what's required from like yeah. a psychology of how you win in that sport, what's what's the skill that's required, but also just kind of like just interested in sporting outcomes. So whether it be like snooker, bowls, darts, I mean, the Olympics <laughs> is just, it's, it's, it's probably like a really dangerous time of the things that you can kind of get interesting that ordinarily you'd never have heard of. Exactly. Do you know where it comes from? Why? Uh... No, not really. I think it's just a bit of kind of like a competitive spirit, probably growing up in a family that, that likes sport right. and like competition, that, that everything that we did, even whether it was Christmas Day, ended up involving some games that my dad had invented. <laughs> uh, Brilliant. Whether it be like flap, flap the fish, but you know, that's, a, that's probably another podcast. <laughs> Sitting on the couch, being analyzed. <laughs> Genius. It sounds like your Christmases were fantastic. A dad that invents games. Yeah, yeah, they were, wow, excellent. Yeah, they were certainly good fun. Uh, <laughs> and then also, uh, so we're going deep here, uh, but there were like valuable prizes that he, he uh, they were always like last minute, ill thought through. So you, you know, you play a game for an hour and you ended up winning a tin of rice pudding, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> resulted in some anticlimax, but then actually became funnier over the years. It's like the presents got worse and worse. Exactly. Um, so on a completely parallel path, um, I've become known at Christmas in our family as a bingo caller. So apparently I've got a career that I never knew I had uh, by being a bingo caller. And apparently I'm very good at it. So every year now we have to play bingo. So yeah, every family has their unique uh, rituals, I think is what we'd call them probably. 
Yeah, yeah. And do, do you know do you know all the number calling then, do you? I'm getting well? better. I'm getting much better. I've got a yeah. script that I read out, but I'm getting much more better at, or much better at ad hoc comments around the numbers. But yeah, I love it. I really enjoy it. <laughs> but yeah, it's a simple pleasures in life often. So before we before our audience starts to think we're talking about sport and bingo, uh, let's talk about uh, agency <laughs> dynamics and sales. So first question. Um, so just talk about the RFP pitch process and kind of reasons, themes, why you kind of win and lose and what you've learned over the past few years uh, about how do you improve your commercial success? One of the things that we've started to uh, focus on uh, more, more intently now is a, is a bit of a reverse on where it used to be, uh, and, and not just sort of my agency, but sort of my agency experience. Uh, there's always a lot of time invested on uh, why you didn't win. Yes. Uh, I know we've kind of touched on this before, but the more I reflect on it, the more that I realize the sort of time and energy is spelt, uh, spent internally, like understanding like the, the pitfalls that might have happened during the pitch process where you think you might not have presented yourself uh, in the, in the right way. Uh, and, and generally, if it, even if it's it has some positive intent, it always ends up on the, on the negative side, but never actually addresses the, the real reasons because you tend to look at internal factors. Uh, but what I find is when you spend more time interrogating why you win, you focus a lot more on external factors. Ah. Uh, because then you start to analyze, well, what was it the client... Uh, selected in us, yeah. Whereas losing tends to be, oh, you know, we didn't like, we didn't kind prepare of properly, the idea. exactly, yeah. Maybe the team wasn't right, or the, you know, we didn't uh, get the right order right in the pitch. It didn't seem, or yeah. like there was something wrong with our costings, etc. Uh, but when you win, you know, you kind of you, like all of those things are assumed to be right. So you don't focus Correct. on, them. you don't think, oh, how could we have done the presentation better? No, because that's right. You won. So therefore, you. are it's kind of like the 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 analytics of it tends to go into well, what was it about the relationship? What was it about the sector? Uh, the work that we were produced? Yeah, what was it about how we uh, pitched uh, like the the commercial proposition? So it tends to be a lot more externally focused. And since we've spent more time and energy on that, I would say that uh, it's increased our win percentage. Interesting. Uh, but also, what it's done uh, is probably reduce the number of pitches that we go for. Yes, absolutely. Because we look more about like uh, the conditions that are right for us to win, and therefore, whereas uh, certainly in a in a time where you know there's like a, a bad commercial environment, whether it be like uh, COVID or, uh, or or recession, uh, you, you feel compelled to go for more. Yeah rather than for less. And you should probably be brave enough to go for less and concentrate on the ones that you can, uh, you've can. you got a higher uh, proportional chance of winning. It's really important, Jonathan. I, all my experience is exactly the same. Working with clients on exactly mm. this issue, the biggest thing I say to them is qualify out 40% roughly of what you receive you shouldn't be bidding for. There's a way of responding that still allows you to engage, but you shouldn't be bidding for about 40%. You've got to qualify them out. But it's counterintuitive for most commercial leaders. And it's scary because you're about to turn mm. down what could be, oh, well, we might have won. Yeah, but, but you're spreading yourselves too thin. Yeah, because you know, it's, it's certainly on the uh, agency side is that uh, uh, a large part of our future sort of planning for growth is based on pipeline. Correct. And if the first stage of that pipeline is narrowing the pipeline, if sort of feels counterintuitive. It does. Uh, but it's critical. I think if you if you fail, agencies that fail to qualify out uh, and bid for everything, um, I mean, as, a, as you know, I'm an ex-buyer. Now, as a buyer, mm. I'm sat there. And if, if I've sent it out to five pre-qualified agencies and I get a response back that, yes, you've answered the questions, but this clearly isn't in your sweet spot, my instant reaction is, why did you bother? Why don't you just tell me not that you weren't going to bid? If it, if you couldn't knock it out of the park, why would you waste commercial effort on it? I don't understand. You've got to be yeah. able to knock it out of the park. And and, uh, and and I think it's understanding that 
from the very start, a pitch process uh, is it's not a it's not just a sort of formality of detail, but it's also a relationship process. Yeah, and I think that gets forgotten as well. Uh, and understanding where you have those relationships and what sort of relationship you have, which might have got you on the on the list in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and understanding how you got on the list is really important. Understanding how you got on the list. Do you want to like, just dig into that a little bit more? Because I think that's a, uh, yeah, it's a critical area. If you bumped into someone at a conference, you exchange business cards and an RFP turns up. Probably not as good as if you've known them for three years and eventually the right piece of work turns up. So what's your room? Um, how do you judge that that, that that relationship piece? Yeah, I, I think for us, we... We we face a, a, a reasonably unique dynamic than compared to uh, other agencies that I've worked at. In that, uh, because of our like specialism, there aren't many agencies around the world who can uh, uh, sort of potentially work at the scale that we can work no, at. You know, we've exactly we've certainly got a, like a strong a strong competitive set, but it tends to me tends to mean that we're on a known list. And therefore, we can get approached by being on that list, yeah. rather than you know bumped into somebody at a conference. So you know, just even had an, an initial uh, uh, conversation. You know, we can be a step back from that, yeah. and just uh, like the the awareness and visibility of, uh, of of what we do can sometimes get us on the list. Yeah, and that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there's the right interrogation gone into like, are we actually the right fit or are we a good fit for the numbers? Yeah. And, uh, I know we've, we, we've, we've talked about this, uh, previously over dinner as well in terms of, uh, you know, the shortlist that, that can be created in your position on that shortlist and understanding the, the, the different makeup of it. And, you know, since we had that conversation, mm. I kind of lived and breathed it. And in exactly the way and the scenario that you set out, right? <laughs> which is very, very frustrating because we were number two <laughs> out of the five or six. Uh, you know, and I, I think you know, we can go into that in a bit more detail, but over, overall, I know as a, as a business, certainly over, over 70% of the pitch wins that we have are because we've got some sort of relationship with a client within the organization, that's either a client that's kind of moved on or somebody that yeah. we've known for a while, or, or it's a relationship that we've cultivated over a period of time. Exactly. Uh, so that both organizations like understand each other. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's a, uh, it's a sort of slam dunk no. uh, <clears throat> victory, but what it does uh, give you is a, is a much uh, a better understanding of how you can work together and therefore your proposition to that client uh, is 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 better. So how much weighting just out of interest do you put on that when you're doing your qualification, whether it's via a mm. spreadsheet or whether it's via a a kind of a, a pitch committee uh, that assesses, how much weighting do you put on that? Where did this um where did this um pitch come from uh in terms of the strength of the relationship? Uh, I, I would say it's kind of like we would kind of break it down, but I, I would say that's certainly uh at, at least fifty percent, uh, because the other fifty percent can be made up of, you know, our uh, our belief in the opportunity and our our, yeah. our fit for it. Uh, but the relationship part of it is is the top. They are the like uh, initial questions before we kind of get into the, the yeah. detail. It doesn't mean to say that if if we don't think the relationship is that strong, we wouldn't not go for it if all the other attributes are, no, uh, sure. are right in terms of it. Could, it could be like a new opportunity, but uh, I, w- I would say that it certainly has uh, the biggest weighting in terms of deciding whether we can win it or not. Exactly. You know, those sort of two questions go together and that's the biggest sort of sense of, uh, of, of, of weighting of whether we can win it or not. Because again, if, it, if I flip the coin over and look at it from the buyer's side, if I've got five agencies that are pitching for a piece of work in my old role, when I was a, a procurement guy, um, I'd know with the stakeholder who their preference is um, before we start the process because you would be in the one of the five and you would have a, mm-hmm. 
what I would call, a, you know, it, it, it's an unfair advantage in a good way. You know, as a procurement person, I, I actually want that to happen. I want the commercial lead on my side to know, yeah, we've got a relationship with Jonathan and his team. We've worked with them for the last like three, four years on small bits and pieces. And this is now a bigger project. And, you know, we know culturally how they work and we know they're a great fit. But it doesn't mean that someone else couldn't win. But when the stakeholder group is reviewing all the pitches, you will have a you'll have an advantage. And I think that's absolutely critical. Yes. It's, it's giving procurement the mandate to be able to help Correct. support a decision because a relationship's not enough. So you need absolutely. to be able to ensure that you can, uh, you know, uh, provide all the, all, all, all the detail and support for the other commercial aspects. That's right. Uh, but, you know, the conversations I've had with procurement are, you know, and, and again, we don't necessarily perceive that from from our perspective because we always look at things from our perspective. Uh, that like reputations are on the line because yeah. procurement are still involved in the in the middle of being able to make the right commercial decisions for a business. Uh, and if they fail because relationships fail, exactly, you know that that circles back to them as as well. And we don't always think about that. And I think Jonathan, you know, I mean, the very idea that. It, just because you've got the relationship, absolutely doesn't mean as a procurement person that you're going to be the one that I appoint. Yeah, you know, if it, because that would be a complete breach of our governance rules. So yeah. you're right, and it's a different stakeholder group. So the relationship's key, but as is engaging with procurement. So actually, in our podcast questions, why don't we go to um, question three next? Because it's a natural lead on, which is how do you yep. su- how do you successfully engage with procurement? And where are the pitfalls? So in that pitch process, you know, how do you successfully engage with procurement? Where are the pitfalls? Uh, what are the success factors? Yeah. The, the one thing as well is the way that procurement approach the process is, all, is, is important for me because I think that gives you uh, a good understanding of the cultural identity of the business. Because if procurement are very remote and, it, and uh, it's... It's kind of uploading to a portal. There's very little opportunity to engage yeah. in conversation. Uh, I, I think that kind of gives a, a, a sense of the challenges that you might face of converting that work. Absolutely. Because I think it's really important and, our, and some of our best relationships have, have, have been through really strong procurement relationships. Because in the end of the day, it's their responsibility to ensure that the right decision has been made for the business. Yeah. And the relationship aspect starts with them of uh, being, able, be, being able to understand what their uh, tensions are, what their priorities are within the business, not just what the marketing like our event team uh, face, but what's happening with them a- across the business. Because that might be impacting on how they make decisions in your sector. Uh, because it's very rare that the procurement uh, team that we deal with work on an isolated part of the business. Exactly, They could be working on a whole broad range of, uh, of procurement decisions, which therefore have some uh, macro strategy to them, yep. uh, which could be around you know, duration of contracts, uh, price saving, incentive-based relationships, whatever, whatever it is. But understanding those uh kind of tensions or, uh, or objectives is, is, is really important. So something, uh, as a question to you on that theme. Mm. Um, I've talked to, obviously, a lot of agencies over the time. Um, and when mm. you talk about, about campaigns they're running for new prospects, for new logos, they'll spend all their efforts campaigning to engage with the CMO, the brand director, whoever it might be, in the agency, in the client, in the brand. And I said, do you have the same approach to the procurement people? do you run campaigns to build relationships with procurement outside of the RFP process? Most people, that's a bit of a revelation. Why would I do that? Mm. And and yet it's the obvious piece of the puzzle that's missing. So do you actively, proactively engage with procurement people outside of the formal process to build a relationship with them? Yeah, and also, uh, I mean, that's that's a really great point because I bet the uh, the broad answer would be like no wouldn't have even crossed correct 
It doesn't cross, cross the people's mind. minds. That's right. Uh, but also, uh, when you won the business, that's not where the relationship ends. That's where the relationship should really start to yeah. flourish and, uh, and, and, and kind of make it ongoing. We've certainly had uh, examples where we've been able to build a, a really strong relationship with a procurement team so that they were able to uh, adapt the rules when we came to what would have been uh, the end of the of, of the contract, which should have ordinarily gone into another procurement cycle. Yeah. But they were then able to like understand our business and say, actually, uh, the fit is there. We know that it's... It, what you uh, provide is not uh, easily accessible more broadly in the market. So therefore we wouldn't be comparing like for like. So yep. uh, we're able to kind of uh, put an extension onto the contract exactly. because we can demonstrate to the business uh, and, uh, and within the, the, like the corporate guidelines that we're, that we're making uh, the, the right and valid commercial decision. That's right. And that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have a, a relationship with procurement. Correct. I mean, just simple things like QBLs. You know, well-structured, mm. well-run QBRs from the agency side into the client with procurement in attendance, you know, engaging them in the SLAs that we've agreed, the targets, KPIs, you know, the future strategy, budgets for next year, all that stuff. You know, it, it makes a massive difference. A badly run QBR from a procurement, procurement person's perspective is a killer for an agency because it just shows that you don't know how to run a commercial relationship review. Yeah, I completely agree. The, the other thing that I, that, uh, an, an, a greater understanding and, uh, and, and, and partnership procurement offers you the opportunity to ensure that you're always being uh, measured on a, a, a comparative basis. Yeah. Because one of the challenges that, that, that we face is sometimes the, the, the price comparison or approach isn't as simple as it looks like on a spreadsheet, whether that be uh, absolutely fee rates or how you uh, uh, price jobs, uh, because there's a lot of nuance in the detail. So sometimes you're not, you, you know, you're not pricing it up in the same way, but on paper it looks like you are. That's right. Uh, whereas being able to have those sort of conversations with procurement can ensure that they understand the numbers that you've put in front of them might not be the same in terms of uh, uh, the depth of detail that somebody else has required. So they, they, you know, they might look uh, less expensive, for example, but when you get into kind of like the detail, That's right. the words are the same, but what's behind the words are not the same. Yeah. So just, I'm very conscious of your time. So let's kind of draw it towards a conclusion. Um, no, no problem. I can go on for a little bit longer if, if that helps. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, in that case, uh, the question that uh, we were going to cover uh, last was, in terms of at a, at a slightly more kind of macro level, um, mm. what do you see as being the challenges with the current way that the pitch process is run? Be that a kind of you know, less formal client brief that's competitive, more formal RFPs, um, repitches for work. Um, so what do you see as being the problems with the way that's run? Um, what can agencies do about it? And although we haven't, I haven't pre-prepared this with you as a question, it's the obvious kind of questions on the table. Mm. How is AI going to change that landscape in the next few years? So quite a big macro question, but I, I'd be fascinated by your thoughts. Uh, I'll come to the AI point last to see if I can uh, get some intelligence to think of how <laughs> I can uh, answer that question. Uh, this is a reasonably complex area. It is a complex uh, area. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say that uh, one of the biggest sort of challenges, and I don't know whether it's just sort of uh, businesses, you know, going through a period of all, all being a bit more remote and therefore uh, automated. Uh, one of the hardest things for agencies, I think, is uh, you know we're we're you know we're people led businesses. Uh, it's a, a, a relationship led uh, output, uh, and as RFPs become more automated, you know, like we mentioned before, of uh, uploading information into portals with very yeah. little opportunity to be able to uh, context that information through dialogue. Uh, I think that makes it 
uh, more challenging for agency, but I, I, I also believe it must make it more challenging for procurement as well. Yeah. And I, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And, and we, we would be very reticent about going through a pitch process where that is the only form of, uh, of contact. I completely you know, agree. Where, where we haven't got some sort of relationship in, in parallel to that that might have got us to that part of the, of, uh, of, of the process. Or something that we know that we're that you know within uh, within the rules and obligations we are actually able to have a relationship with that client, and that and that could be because it's an existing client or somebody that we've worked with previously. Yeah. But any occasion where the RFP is uh, is is almost anonymized. Yeah. Uh, is something that we would tend to try and shy away from. I completely agree, and I think sure, and I think and, and, uh, yeah. No, I think most agencies should. If really simple thing if in the RFP it says at no point can you talk to anyone in the stakeholder community until you've been down selected to present the final pitch Mm i.e. here's the RFP you can't talk to us best foot forward spend 100 person hours writing it send it in by the portal and we'll let you know that that's not a pitch process there's no way that an agency can read the minds of the stakeholder group through a document that's been written broadly by procurement interviewing stakeholders. There'll be all sorts of things missing, all sorts of nuances missing, all sorts of priorities missing, lots of emotional aspects missing. So to me, it's just like, that's a, a real red flag if you cannot talk to anyone before you start to put um, keyboard to document. Yeah, because... It's it's almost sort of it's not uh, you know, a pitch process should be uh, you know a win win for both parties that you're uh, creating a really constructive yeah. uh, relationship through through that commercial process. The more distance that you create, it feels as though it's uh, it's actually based on a like a, a you know a risk averse of failure rather than uh, like a focus on a, like a positive outcome. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, and you know, I can't. I can't think of any occasion where we've gone through that process where, even if we've ended up uh, like winning or being uh, put on a roster, and we've gone through that process, it's never. It's it's never really. Uh, I can't think of an example where you can. Oh, actually, no. We've turned that around. It's it's worked out really well. We've built yeah. a relationship post all that process. Uh, what's tended to happen is uh, it's remained distance throughout. Exactly. And then every time an opportunity comes up, you're kind of submitting a, uh, a, a price, but it's kind of going into a, 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 a void. Uh, yeah, so the, like, the time and energy spent has never really uh, manifests itself positively anyway. Exactly right. Absolutely. What do you, so what, what's your kind of, from this kind of conversation, what are your kind of two or three takeaways for your kind of fellow agency leaders? Uh, about the whole pitch process, how you uh, how do you win more um, uh, in that kind of environment? I think it's really important to uh, focus on uh, the the why are you there. What were the conditions that caused you to be part of that process and that uh, conversation? I think uh, believe in the in the transparency of of relationships. Uh, because you're not trying to like circumnavigate the process, no. you're trying to make the process as effective as you can for both parties. I mean, do not underestimate the the longevity of relationships with procurement. It's not an in the moment thing. Think about it before, during, and and after, uh, as 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 part of uh, you know your uh, client relationship portfolio. You know, as 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 you would with any sort of client group. You know, matching off. Uh, you know the comparative uh, skills and, and personalities that fit right with the the, uh, the client organisation, whether it's be you know a creative lead with a creative lead, for example. But think about how you're going to manage that from uh, the commercial side as as well. Uh, ultimately, everybody wants their lives to be easier, and uh, and businesses want to be able to make sound commercial decisions where they're confident in the in the success of the outcome. Yes, and, and I think you can do to help bridge that. Is, is definitely something to to focus on and uh, and and the relationship aspects of it and understanding where that relationship started from is is really critical. 
Uh, I think he asked me for three, and I think that's only two. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the third one is uh, is understanding uh, pricing. I know that's going to, going into a, a bit more detail, but really ensure that you're understanding how they are viewing the you know, the commercial proposition from a pricing perspective, and sometimes. It, it might be that you put something forward you, which you think is a bonus, uh, uh, like aspects or, you know, t- t- in terms of the, like, the way that you uh, run and manage your business with, with clients. But if somebody's not doing the same on the other side, but that's not transparent, therefore it, it, it can end up counting against you, even though you think you've put forward like a positive proposal. Yeah. Like for, for us, that would be, uh, you know, we, we don't mark up third party costs. So we just pass through costs and we you know, as, as, as a business, we drive our profitability through uh, our, our, our fees and the time spent working with clients, rather than any sort of pass-through costs. Now, if if that's not clear and transparent on all sides, that can uh, impact negatively on us in terms of like how we might be viewed uh, on, a, on a kind of benchmarking perspective. And uh, yeah. and, and and that could be uh, just because you've not been able to. Uh, have have the conversation to be able to understand and get clarity on like how uh, they're interrogating some of the information that's put in front of them, so that you can put the right information in front of them. Exactly right, Jonathan. So um, just before we close, um, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe we cover the AI question on a separate discussion. I might have a follow up actually with a few people around how then how is AI going to change the landscape of the pitch uh, process. But any kind of like final thoughts on that? Uh, I- I think we're, one of the one of the main things is that uh, it it will probably fast track some of the uh, the, the kind of back end formality. Yeah. Uh, the longer discussion for me is in terms of what it can uh, deliver in terms of creativity, for example, and it, and it can't overcome the relationship aspect. But some of the uh, uh, reporting. Uh, uh, like the 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 interrogation and approach and and helping uh, sort of fast track some of the uh, uh, the more more sort of formalised uh, uh, approaches that will probably uh, help and and uh, and, and fast track some of some of that aspects. I think so. Uh, and yeah, def- I definitely think it's a sort of uh, bigger discussion. Certainly, lots of uh, aspects of our business that we can certainly use. AI in the future, the way that it's uh, developing, it's, it's just how you commercialize that into your proposition. Exactly right. Yeah, and I think there's lots to, lots can be done for internal efficiency. I think there's a big question about what does that mean for clients and what does that mean in terms of benefit for clients as well as benefit for the agency. So yeah, separate discussion. I would say on that. Jonathan, yeah, and sorry, go on. yeah, like right, sorry, just a one thing. It's just yeah. that, like uh, I, I've started to use the sort of term assisted insight. Yes, because that's really the main driver of it. Uh, that you can get some information faster. That's a great uh, and in a more inter- or in a more interrogated way. No, I think that's, that it, it's a great summary. Actually, assisted insight. I use it for the same thing. It's a great starting point. So if I've got a complex thing I'm solving for a client, I'll use ChatGPT to get some ideas. But it's just a starting point. And then I'll spend the time thinking more deeply using my experience and their context. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it is, it, it, it's assisted insight. I think it's a good way of summarizing it. Jonathan, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you ever so much for being a guest on Higgle, the B2B Sales Club podcast. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can uh, check me out on, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I, I try and use uh, Volunteer to use uh, LinkedIn more, more prevalently. <laughs> Uh, which I'm trying. Uh, and then uh, our website's uh, gpj.co.uk if you want to find out more about the company. Brilliant. Jonathan, thanks ever so much for being a guest. Thank you very much indeed. Ah, thanks as ever. Thanks for listening to Higgle, the B2B sales club podcast series with your host, Mike Lander. Please subscribe so that you'll catch all the next episodes.